Okay, I'm going to go ahead. Welcome to the EECS Colloquium on behalf of myself, uh, Professor Paulus, and also my co-chair, uh, um, right in front here, Eli Yablonovich. Um, our speaker today doesn't need much of an introduction, but I do want to give him one. Let me first, before I do that, tell you that next week, uh, Wallace Marshall will be speaking here. Um, isn't it great to have the power back on, by the way? <laughs> Yes, so our speaker from last week, we are trying to reschedule. So for those of you who were anxiously at home in the darkness or not, uh, we will be rescheduling. Um, optimization, control, objective functions. As computer scientists, we think about all of these. And our speaker today, our very own Professor Stuart Russell, really talks about a fundamental reorientation of this field and some of our ways that we think about this. Uh, he's, of course, a professor here. He's also, his, he got his bachelor's degree in physics from Oxford, his PhD in computer science from Stanford. Here he's the uh, Smith, <laughs> ah, yes, please, uh, Smith Zade professor in engineering at Berkeley. He's also an adjunct professor of uh, neurolog neurological surgery at UCSF. He also is the vice chair of the World Economic Forum's Council on AI and Robotics, which is extraordinarily impressive. Um, he's an honorary fellow at Wadham College at Oxford. He has the Carnegie Fellowship, a long list of distinguished uh, accolades during his career. I would best describe him as uh, an extremely inspirational computer scientist, uh, humanist, philosopher, provocateur, and I mean that in the highest uh, sense of the word, um, an activist, and I think he really talks a lot in about some of the technologies of our time. He has fundamentally made significant contributions to artificial intelligence, and now um, his position speaking out about particular issues of threat of autonomous weapons and the long-term future of artificial intelligence, primarily in uh, many of his writings, uh, many of them you see on in uh, publications, but he has a new book out, Human Compatible Artificial Intelligence and the Problem of Control. I was going to bring in the book, but it's digital, so. <laughs> Sorry, I bought it on a Kindle. Okay, so uh, without further ado, uh, welcome Professor Stuart Russell. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, okay, so let me provide a little bit of history. Just, I think it's useful to have this background. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the news these days about the potential upsides and downsides of AI, but actually it's been going on longer. It's not just the last couple of years. Um, in fact, in, in th around 340 BC, Aristotle was writing about the possible consequences of intelligent automation um, on employment. So this was the first writing uh, that we know of about technological unemployment. Uh, and he said, look, if the uh, you know, if the musical instruments can play themselves and the, the loom can weave its own cloth, then we won't need any slaves. And this would be a big, a big problem for unemployment figures. Um, so th that was a long time ago. And uh, I say in the book, actually, you know, Aristotle, uh, if he'd had a computer uh, and I suppose some electricity, then he would have been uh, an AI researcher. Because uh, when, you, when you read what he writes, you know, he talks about planning algorithms, obviously logical reasoning, you know, with formal syntax and semantics of logical languages, uh, forward chaining, backward chaining, all kinds of stuff uh, is very clearly laid out uh, in, the, in the work he did. Taxonomic hierarchies, semantic networks, ontologies. Um, so anyway, uh, he didn't have a computer. Babbage had uh, at least a plan for a computer. Um, and they talked, uh, Babbage and, and Lovelace talked very explicitly about how they'd be able to use that to do anything uh, that the, man, the mind of man uh, can be applied to could be done by, by these machines. So they, they were pretty clear that um, we were going to be able to have human level AI if only we can get all of these cogs and gears uh, to, to mesh and move quickly enough. Uh, but he never, he never quite built his machine. But, but news of the invention and, and the uh, predictions got out there into the wide world. Um, and actually, there was, a, there was a religious newspaper in Illinois called the Primitive Expounder. And the editor of that newspaper got wind of what Babbage was talking about and uh, predicted that if such machines were built, uh, they would eventually take over the world. Um, so that's the first one we know of in print, uh, giving the apocalyptic view of AI. Um, and then. Uh, 
we had to wait another 100 years for there to be actual computers, uh, thanks to World War II, among other things. Um, and Alan Turing uh, is famous, among many things, for, for this paper. This is the paper that has the Turing test uh, from 1950. Um, what's less well known is that he also talked about what would happen if we actually achieved human-level AI. And um, he was completely resigned. Uh, he said, we should have to expect the machines to take control. Um, and so when you hear complaints from people, so, so now you know, Elon Musk gets up and says something like this, he's, he's shouted down as an idiot who doesn't know anything about AI and so on. Are they going to shout down Alan Turing as an idiot who doesn't know anything about AI? <coughs> then who would be left, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, so, so Turing pointed this out. And the, you know, the field itself got going in 56 with its official birthplace in Dartmouth. Uh, and we've had waves of optimism, waves of disappointment. Right now, we're in a wave of optimism. Uh, hard to say what's happening next. Uh, I still think it's a little balanced on the knife edge as to whether the optimism will dissipate or enough new things will happen with enough success that it will keep going. Um, so one of the big things that's happened uh, you know, the, these are the media events. These are, these are not really the research advances. These are the media events. So from the outside world, they don't have a clue what happens here. Uh, they, people in the outside world, think of this as a research breakthrough, right? Despite the fact that it was based on, you know, Samuel 1957 uh, and, uh, you know, Lecun 1992. Um, so the research breakthroughs happened 70 years ago and uh, and 20 years ago, but they put it together and made a, a big thing happen, which was beating the, world, uh, the world's best Go players. Um, and, uh, you know, and this was the Sputnik moment for China. This was the event uh, that caused China to wake up and say, this AI stuff is for real, uh, and we are going to dominate it. And uh, so they have announced plans for 150 billion uh, or so in investment over the next decade. Um, and the U.S. has struck back with uh, a, a new plan for the National AI Research Institutes with uh, 124 million. <laughs> so, so, so as we know, right, you know, the media in particular have trouble distinguishing between million and billion. They often, they often get them confused, and now apparently the American government has also got that, that dis <laughs> important distinction confused. Um, so anyway, I'm sure it'll help. Um, so all of these plans in the UK, with the bill this is billion pounds, 1.5 billion euros from the French, 18 billion pounds from the EU, uh, and of course China. So it's, it's, it's impossible to open a newspaper these days without seeing headlines about AI. Uh, you know, um, it, it's a ridiculous time to be, to be in this field. Um, so I wanted to inject a little bit of um, realism. Uh, this, was, this was a very... Uh, one, what, this is not quite as big as Lee Sedol losing, but uh, this was a, a system developed by OpenAI showing that you can actually train, um, you can train humanoid robots starting from nothing. So these are newborn babies who have no motor control skills whatsoever, and in a few hours you can train them to, you know, to locomote, to kick the ball at the goal, to try and stop the ball from scoring, and so on. So um, this was a big Thing. Lots of people got very excited about this. Um, and and it's, it's sort of cool to look at, you know, it's sort of purposive behavior. Uh, you know, they adjust, he adjusts to where the ball is, the goalkeeper. <laughs> goalkeeper is sort of tracking fairly well. His goalkeeper's a little bit uncoordinated. Anyway, so <laughs> we, we thought, well, okay, how real is this? And so my student, Adam Gleave, said, okay, let's, let's just change the red program. So we'll leave the blue program exactly the same. And we're going to change the red program and see if we can uh, make this game a little more even, because right now the blue guy usually wins. Um, so here's the solution, right? Um, which is to simply fall over <laughs> on the ground and waggle your leg in the air like, <laughs> like this. Right? Now, you notice we didn't change the blue program at all. But now look what the blue guy is doing, <laughs> right? He, <he's laughs> 
you know, and I think this is one of my favorite, right? Because he's just like, ah, 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 oh, oh, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, so he sort of lost the plot completely. <laughs> even, 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 though, even though it's the same program, right? So, so what this tells you is that your, your perceptions of, of the behavior, the capabilities of I systems are often overly generous. Right? You see one instance of good behavior and you say, oh, it's really good at you know, playing soccer or whatever. Right? But it isn't. <laughs> so there are these enormous uh, gaps in performance that we don't have to look that hard to find them. Um, so we have to be much more careful, I think. And you know, imagine this happens with a self-driving car. Right? You, you, know, you train it in Mountain View, it does really well, and then you, know, you do some some weird thing, like you change the color of the street sign, and all of a sudden, it just goes completely insane and starts driving around and doing donuts in the middle of the freeway and things like that, right? So you just, until you understand what it's doing, you don't know whether it's actually as good as you think it is, and that's a really important lesson. So, um, you know, The Economist had data is the new oil on the front cover. Um, but I think we actually have to be, uh, <laughs> we have to be more careful. It's, it's not, and there's a, there's a particular technical reason why this, this simple meme that whoever has the most data wins the world, right? That's the meme that you see. Uh, that is the pol this is the basis on which geopolitical strategy is being formulated, but it's not really true. Um, in fact, as AI systems get better, they should need less and less data, not more and more data. Humans need one or two examples uh, to learn a new visual category. When you see a, a giraffe for the first time, you don't need another 180,000 <laughs> examples of giraffes before you sort of got the idea of what a giraffe is. You see one, right? And you talk to any psychologist, how many training examples do humans need? One, sometimes two, right? Um, and so as we get AI systems that are more capable, uh, they will need less data, and just having vast quantities doesn't get you what you want. Um, and if there is going to be something that bursts the bubble, I think it will be potentially the failure of the self-driving car enterprise. Not, I'm not that it's an impossible problem, but it has to happen fast enough for the people who've invested billions of dollars a year uh, to, to not lose patience. Um, and so there's kind of a little race going on between the patience of the investors and uh, the performance and safety of the system. And uh, I don't know how that's going to turn out. So the, the, they made very impressive progress, but you've got to get you know, eight nines of reliability, and they're still only at five or six nines of reliability. So, uh, so it's, it's a small difference, but you could say you know, it's a hundredfold or thousandfold uh, reduction in the error rate. Uh, and so that's a, that's a big step to get to. OK, um, so I, having said that, I'm reasonably optimistic that we will start to see many more, so not just AI systems that uh, convince you to buy more toilet paper than you could possibly imagine you ever needed, <laughs> but um, systems that actually you know, are for robots getting out there outside the factory into the real world. So roads is one place, but warehouses will probably be first. Um, and they're already doing simple tasks in warehouses, just fetching or carrying, but uh, not so much based on perception. But when we, when we solve, and I think we're in the process of solving the problem of picking uh, an arbitrary object uh, out of a bin, uh, which doesn't sound that hard, right? You've got a big bin of stuff, and you say, okay, pick out the watermelon, or you know, pick out the, wa uh, the water pistol, or whatever it might be. Uh, if you have a system that can do that, uh, then that's 10 million jobs. Uh, going, right? um, and so that that will be uh, a very big step, a very visible step. Um, the homes will probably come last, right? I mean, we'll see trivial toy applications and you know the little thing that makes drinks and serves them, but it's, it's a very stupid robot. To get a system that really can function uh, in the home, which is a very variable place, uh, unpredictable, um, and physically complicated. Uh, that, that's going to be more difficult than these other problems. Um, on the digital side, I think we'll see intelligent personal systems that can actually uh, understand enough about your life, your activities, your relationships, your commitments, your communications, 
to really be useful, not just to be a parrot and a, and a sort of voice interface to a search engine, like most of the systems are right now, but something that is actually a partner uh, in your life and could be incredibly useful. In the same way that you know executives have expensive human personal assistants, uh, you could have something uh, for 99 cents a month um, that is as useful, um, but that would be for everybody. And most people probably have more need of it uh, because their lives are more difficult. Um, another consequence, I, and I, if I had to say, you know, what's the thing that's most likely to get solved in the next decade? It's, it's the next level of language understanding. Um, so if you just think, okay, what happened in the last decade or this, the decade we're just finishing, it's uh, visual object recognition. That was the, the biggest step. Um, I think in the next decade, uh, the ability to extract content from language, uh, you know, think, you know, reading some text and generating database entries, uh, logical assertions, or whatever it might be. So not deep understanding. They're not going <coughs> to read James Joyce and, and, and write a thesis about it, um, but they'll be able to read, you know, all the documents on the web, every newspaper, every television broadcast in, in every language, uh, and that will be an incredible facility for the human race, you know, and, and if you think search engines are worth a trillion dollars easily, uh, maybe two trillion now, um, this would be 10 times as valuable uh, for, for the human race. Um, another interesting thing that I'm actually uh, recently joined the board of Planet, which is a San Francisco company that has the largest number of satellites uh, in the world. And um, so now that it's possible to image every square foot of the Earth every day, um, you, you could, if you had enough people, about 30 million people, you could look at all those images uh, and you could keep track of all the things in the, on the Earth and what they're up to. Um, but uh, with now with computer vision applied to that data stream, uh, we could actually turn the Earth into a continuously updated database. Uh, on, on top of that, you can build thousands of different applications um, and this is one of the things that we're working with the UN uh, to think of all the ways you could use that for the st sustainable development goals. Uh, so you think about um, you know, urban planning, you think about uh, managing livestock um, on the plains of Africa where it's not all fenced off and so on, but it's a very difficult management problem, uh, anti-poaching, all kinds of stuff that you can imagine, uh, managing, managing shipping, uh, looking for smuggling, uh, the, the list goes on and on and on and on. But each of those applications, if you wanted to build it by itself, would cost a billion dollars to build because uh, collecting all this data, storing it, processing it is an expensive business. But if that's done once and then you feed the results to anyone who wants to build an application on top of that, then it's like a million dollars to produce a 24-7 global service uh, that would have some high value. So. This is, I think, uh, uh, something that's going to be happening fairly soon. OK, so does this all mean that we're going to have human-level AI? Is it around the corner? Uh, so different people have different views. Um, for example, uh, Elia Sutskiva, who is one of the people who worked on the, the visual object recognition breakthroughs with Jeff Hinton, is now the chief scientist at OpenAI. He believes it's five years' time. Right, and they just got a big investment from Microsoft, a lot of which is going to be scaling up their already gargantuan computer resources. Uh, so when I say gargantuan, I mean one Google TPU pod is equivalent of 10 million laptops. Right, and uh, it's fairly, it's not huge, right? I mean, it's about, uh, so you can imagine, yeah, about 12 feet long and eight feet high, uh, and so on. But you know, it, it, it would fit in your bedroom. Uh, and that's already more powerful than the world's biggest supercomputer was two years ago. Uh, so the, the numbers are astronomical. It's also, I mean, it's the number of operations per second, 10 to the 17, is in the same ballpark as the theoretical maximum number of uh, state changes that the brain can achieve. Um, so, uh, and they, they're thinking of going a thousand times beyond that, uh, and th they believe seriously that that will achieve human level AI. I don't believe it at all because, uh, because those are circuits, right? I mean, if there's one thing you learn in computer science, 
And circuits are circuits and programs are programs. And they're much more powerful, and much more expressive. Uh, you know, so if you, if you think about, let's say, writing the rules of chess in circuit language, uh, you know, it's hundreds of thousands of pages because you've got to have you know, a different piece of circuit for every square. Uh, everything has to be repeated uh, for every square, for every move, and so on, for each, each pawn, and so on. It's, it's ridiculous, the blow up uh, that comes from having these inexpressive languages. Uh, and of course, in, in the programming language, it's a page. In English, it's a page. In first order logic, it's a page. Right? And there's a reason why these are all uh, about the same, because th this, is the, uh, this is the level of expressive power um, that you need to, to deal with a large, complicated world that has lots of things in it. Things, right? Things are really important. The world has lots of things in it. Um, and that means you need something with the expressive power of first order logic. Propositional logic, the language of circuits, doesn't have any things in it. Right? So you can't talk about all the pawns, or all the squares, or all the time steps, uh, or all the people, or all the donkeys, or giraffes, or whatever. You can't say that. Uh, in a circuit language. Um, and so my belief is there's no possibility that uh, just making bigger and bigger circuits is going to solve the problem of human level AI. Instead, I think we need these real um, conceptual breakthroughs that are actually very hard to predict. So you can't plot some kind of Moore's law curve and say, oh, look, it crosses human intelligence in, in 2029 or anything like that, right? Um, Instead, you have to wait for the conceptual breakthroughs. Um, so I've listed some of them here. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, but probably the biggest one uh, is the third one, um, because that's what enables humans to function successfully in the real world. Right? The fact that <coughs> we can operate seamlessly on scales ranging from uh, you know, individual motor control actions, like you know, your brain has to send a whole complicated stream of, of commands to your tongue or your fingers when you're typing um, on, on a scale of a few milliseconds per command, um, all the way up to doing a PhD, which is you know, five years, uh, about a trillion motor control commands. Right? And that trillion, that trillion goes in the exponent. Right? It's the, the, the length. Right? If you remember, for if you've taken AI, right, it'd uh, be the branching factor to the power of D, the depth of the solution. So it's the D is a trillion, okay? So there's no possibility that you, just by having more computing power, you can scale up to that. And humans uh, manage this by uh, being able to reason seamlessly at many levels of abstraction. Um, and we have some inkling of how to do that if someone provides the levels of abstraction, if someone gives you a hierarchy of actions at different scales, and then you can sort of string them together in clever ways. But uh, where that hierarchy comes from we have no real clues yet about how machines could develop their own hierarchies as they go along. That, to me, is the biggest open problem. And that could be solved. You know, maybe someone's already solved it while I'm talking. Um, so th these things can happen uh, quite quickly. And just to illustrate that, um, well you can look back at the last time we invented a civilization-ending technology, uh, which is nuclear energy. and um, so the consensus in the early part of the century, so they knew that the energy was there, right? They had E equals MC squared. They could measure the masses of different, uh, uh, different isotopes. They could tell you exactly how much energy uh, would be released if you could cause one of these transitions. Um, but they were absolutely convinced that this was impossible. And, and Rutherford, who was the, the man who split the atom, Nobel Prize winner, probably the most famous nuclear physicist, uh, he gave a speech in, uh, in Leicester uh, on September 11th, and he was asked, you know, is there any possibility we could do this you know, even in the next 25 or 30 years? And he said, it's, no, it's moonshine to even think we could do that. And Einstein agreed with him. Right? Einstein said, I he couldn't think of any imaginable way uh, that you could, uh, you could cause these transitions to occur. Um, and then Leo Zillard read about this in the Times uh, the next morning, and he t went for a little walk, and while he was <laughs> <coughs> While he was crossing the road, he invented the nuclear chain reaction. <laughs> so, um, so it went from this is completely impossible in the opinion of all, all leading physicists to essentially solved. And it was only 12 years after that that the first nuclear bomb was exploded. 
Right? So, so betting against human ingenuity, right? this is one of the arguments that some people who are skeptical about uh, any, any possible risk from AI, um, this is what they say. Right? Actually, you know, it, capable AI is impossible. Um, and so we don't need to worry. Um, and I, I find this a bizarre line of argument. It's basically like saying, okay, well, yes, we are driving the human race towards a cliff in this big bus uh, at the, as fast as we can go, right? The hundreds of billions of dollars of investment to create this technology. We are going as fast as we can towards the cliff, our pedal to the metal, but I guarantee you we're going to run out of gas before we go over the edge. Right? Would you get in that bus? <laughs> right? No. I, it just, it, that, and then there's no argument as to why human level AI is impossible. Um, and how could there be? Right? We know it's possible in the sense that we know our brains are capable of generating this level of intelligence. So it, you can't argue that it's physically impossible to do. Um, and so um, this is a very disappointing development that even people in AI, in order to avoid talking about risks, are willing to say, no, AI will fail, right? Um, which, is, which is weird, right? Imagine a cancer biology, right? So, you know, the leading cancer biologists of our era are standing up and saying, you know what? We're never going to cure cancer. Keep giving us lots of funding, but I guarantee we're never going to cure cancer. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> what are you talking about? So that's the situation we face. Anyway, um, so I think it's prudent to assume, like you can't guarantee, I mean, of course, we could destroy ourselves before this happens, but I think it's prudent to work on the assumption that we will develop AI systems that are fundamentally more capable of making decisions than humans. They will clearly have access to much more information. They will be able to look further ahead in, in the future than humans can, just as they already do on the chessboard and the Go board and the video games and so on. Um, I think this will eventually translate to, to real world decision making. So this could be a, a good thing. If it wasn't for the fact that there was some upside, we wouldn't be having this conversation, right? Because if there were no upside, we wouldn't be spending all this money and nobody, be, nobody would be doing AI at all. So of course there is a big upside. And one way of saying what that is, is that, um, uh, you know, our civilization is really the result of intelligence. If you suddenly have access to a lot more, you can have a much better civilization. Um, and uh, so, you know, instead of thinking um, about small improvements like well, better medical diagnosis, you know, safer cars, I mean, yeah, that's nice, but that's not very ambitious. Um, you think about travel, right? If you wanted to go to Australia 200 years ago, uh, that will be a multi-year, multi-billion dollar project with about 80% chance of death, right? Um, and now if you want to go to Australia, you, you take out your cell phone, tap, 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 and you're in Australia tomorrow. And relatively speaking, it's free, right, compared to what it used to be. Um, and imagine that same transformation occurring to everything. Everything that's currently expensive, like you know, construction projects, we need a new hospital. We need a you know, road to connect our village to the metropolitan areas. We, we need this, we need that, we need better. You know, we don't have any teachers in our school. Uh, whatever it is that is currently difficult, expensive, takes a long time, um, AI systems could provide for us. Uh, so, the, um, you know, just, so I'm not talking about AI systems inventing cures for cancer or faster than light travel or any, any of the sort of science fiction things. Um, just making available to people uh, on a large scale what we already know how to do um, would be about a tenfold increase in GDP, right? So just bringing everyone up to a kind of Berkeley standard of living uh, is a tenfold increase in GDP of the world, which is a $13,500 trillion net present value. Right? So that's sort of cash equivalent of what, what this is worth. Um, and that's why Countries like China are investing hundreds of billions of dollars in this. Uh, and when you look at the size of the prize, that number is negligible. Right? Anything measured in billions is negligible compared to the value that uh, can be generated. Okay. And so, um, so I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that as things progress, we're not going to be limited by research funding or 
you know, money that industry can contribute or spend on research. We're going to be limited by uh, our ability to have enough people uh, who can actually put this transformation into practice. Um, okay, and when you, when you have a world like that, right, um, then, then material wealth becomes like digital copies of the newspaper. Right? Fighting over how many digital copies of the newspaper you have uh, is just insane. Um, and trying to grab a larger fraction of the digital copies of a newspaper uh, is insane. So, um, so I think it would change that part of the dynamic of history that has to do with competition over resources, access to whatever makes life physically worth living. Um, that can all change. We can still kill each other for religious reasons um, and so on. Uh, the, the one thing that doesn't change actually is land. We, we may kill each other over access to land because at least for the time being, AI systems can't make more of that. Um, okay, so there's lots of downsides that people have talked about. Um, the messi messing with our uh, understanding of reality, um, uh, just straightforward killing each other. Um, and uh, I was going to show this little video. Um, so this is called Slaughterbots. You can find it on YouTube. Um, and uh, it, it, it makes the point uh, in simple terms for policymakers that if you create weapons that can locate uh, and select and kill human targets without human supervision, uh, you're all computer scientists, right? You understand what scalability means. You understand that Google does not have a billion employees answering all those questions that we send. Right? How do they do it? Those billions of questions, they buy more hardware. Right? And so just as Google can answer billions of queries a day, uh, you can kill millions of people uh, just by buying more of these. Right? You don't need to have a vast army with a huge military industrial complex. Um, you can just have a weapon of mass destruction by buying more of them um, and then sending them off to do their business. Okay, unfortunately, the sound's not working, so I'm not going to show you the whole movie. Um, but uh, I did want to point out that you know, when we brought that movie out in 2017, um, some, for example, the Russian ambassador to the UN complained that this was just science fiction and, and this would not be even a thing for another 30 years and, and, and he was insulted that we were even bringing this to the United Nations. Um, but now, uh, you know, you can actually go and buy something that's actually a lot worse than the weapon we showed. Uh, so the Turkish company STM is producing this, the Kargu drone, uh, and um, uh, they advertise its capabilities. Autonomous hit, targets selected based on images, uh, tracking moving targets, anti-personnel, and face recognition. So all these are advertised in the sales materials uh, for this, and they have announced their intention to use it against the Kurds. Um, their announcement was for early 2020, but maybe they got to move up that thanks to President Trump. Um, so we might see attacks for the first time of this type of autonomous weapon on human beings uh, coming from Syria. Okay, uh, end of employment, um, <laughs> ev evil people misusing AI to, to take over or destroy the world. Um, overuse of AI uh, resulting in a gradual enfeeblement of the human race. And I think this is, this is a very difficult problem uh, to deal with because we are naturally lazy. Right? Even if we know in the long run that we will become enfeebled, it's always easier to say, okay, well, just for today, yeah, sure, you can tie my shoelaces. I'll learn how to do it tomorrow. But even for today, you can tie my shoelaces. Right? So it's, uh, it's a problem that, again, it's, you know, like other problems, for thousands of years we've known that this is a tendency that we have uh, to, um, to basically hand over knowledge of how to run things to someone else. And here we would just be able to hand it over to machines, which we've never, you know, we've, we've never been able to do that before. To have a civilization that continues, you've always had to hand it over to the next generation of humans. And so we've done about a trillion person years of uh, teaching and learning just to keep our civilization going. Um, and now we don't have to do that anymore because we can pass it on to the machines and they can run the civilization. 
Um, and that may be an irreversible step. OK, so in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I'll talk about um, possibly the, the most serious issue, right? So why are people writing, writing this kind of headline? Uh, what is Elon Musk talking about when he says, you know, you're summoning the demon? Right? Uh, what he means is um, that you're making something more intelligent than yourself. How exactly do you propose to control it? Right? How exactly do you propose to maintain power forever over something that is intrinsically more powerful than you are? Right? That's the question uh, that we face. Um, so just to, as a little warning, right, we, uh, our, our friendly social media companies have provided a little warning to us, very public spirited of them to do this. Um, right? So they, they deployed. Uh, on a global scale, fairly simple machine learning algorithms that are designed to optimize a particular objective, in this case, click-through. Um, and you might think, OK, well, how do we optimize click-through? The algorithm just learns what people want to click on and, and doesn't send them stuff they're not interested in. That sounds sort of OK. Um, you know, but you know, even that can produce a kind of an echo chamber filter bubble mentality where you, you're never even exposed to other thoughts and ideas beyond the ones you're already comfortable with. But actually, it's much, 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 much worse than that, right? because that's not what the algorithms did. What the algorithms did was to modify people, not to learn what people are like, but actually to modify what people are like so that they are more predictable, because that way you can get more money out of them. Right? And this is not like some evil uh, psychological plan. The algorithms don't know that humans exist. The algorithms don't know that humans have minds. Um, all the, from the algorithm's point of view, a human is just a click history. That's all we are, right? What, what have you been exposed to and what did you click on? Right? So we're just a click history. Um, but you can generate more clicks by, by, it turns out, sending people more and more and more extreme material. They might start out sort of in the middle of some spectrum. Um, let's say YouTube videos. Uh, you send them something that's a little bit more violent and a little bit more violent. They gradually move their center of mass to the point where they are addicts of extreme violent uh, YouTube videos. And this, re this is a documented process. Um, and it's happening in politics. It's happening in, in other areas of, of media consumption. Um, and the, cons the reason is that um, you set up an objective you with a sufficiently powerful system. If that objective is the wrong one, uh, then you have these, this massive collateral damage. Um, and, uh, and that's the issue that we're, that we're concerned about. It's not a new issue for the human race. We've known about this. We, you know, we have the legend in King Midas. You know, his objective, everything I touch should turn to gold, right? Is, sounds good until you realize that includes your food and your drink. Uh, and then you die, right? Uh, you know, the, the genie who gives you three wishes, you know, what's the third wish? Third wish is please undo the first two wishes because I got them wrong. Right. And so, so many, many cultures have these kinds of stories um, which basically point to the fact that we are unable to state the objectives correctly. We're unable to anticipate all the ways that the objective might be optimized uh, and all the collateral damage that might ensue. So, um, so in fact, what I'm arguing is that the, the fundamental way that we went about defining AI in the first place, um, starting in the 50s, was wrong. Um, so here's roughly speaking what we said. We, you know, here's what here's what we mean by human intelligence in this context. It means the ability to to choose actions that can be expected to achieve our objectives. Right. That's that was you know the economic notion of rationality, the philosophical notion of rational behavior, um, and we just copy that to machines. We said, okay, so machines are intelligent to the extent that their actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. That's great. Um, it's not just AI. This is control theory. This is statistics, where you know you minimize a loss function. Operations research, where you maximize a sum of rewards. Um, you know, even economics, where you, you know, maximize profit or you maximize welfare, uh, GDP. You know, you specify an objective, uh, and then you create machinery uh, that optimizes that objective. And if you um, specify the objective wrong, your uh, and the system is more powerful 
than you, you're then in a chess match. And we know what happens, right? The machine achieves its objective and you don't. And uh, this, is, so this is the nature of the problem. So this is actually just bad engineering, right? It's, it's an engineering approach that works only if you, the human, are able to specify the objective correctly. Right? But we know that we can't. So you, know, you wouldn't have an airplane that you can only fly if you have seven hands. Right? That would be a stupid airplane design because you don't have seven hands. So why do we have designs for you know, an entire field that requires us to specify objectives correctly? Otherwise, we get all these uh, negative consequences. So instead, um, we have to face the fact that our objectives are going to be in us. Uh, and we can provide clues, some of which will be wrong. We can, the system can figure out from uh, evidence, such as our own choice behavior, what our true preferences and objectives are. But fundamentally, the machine is going to remain ignorant of what it's supposed to be doing, which is to be a benefit to us. Um, so this is what we would like to be able to do. Machines are beneficial to the extent that their actions can be expected to achieve our objectives. Okay, so that's the specification. And um, so I, I tried to explain this in three principles, because that's as many as you can have, uh, apparently. Right, so the robot's, <laughs> the robot's goal is be a benefit to humans, or satisfy human preferences. Um, and when I say preferences, I don't mean what kind of pizza you want. I mean, what, how would you like the future to unfold? Right? Which future do you want, and which future do you not want? Okay? Um, so that's what we mean by preferences. And the robot is always going to be uncertain about what those preferences are. Um, but there is a grounding for preferences that um, uh, our preferences are, are manifested in some form by our behavior. Every choice that we ever make, right, including your choice to be sitting here listening to me, right, is evidence about your underlying preferences. Um, and it's imperfect evidence because we don't behave rationally. Our actions do not always maximally satisfy our preferences. In fact, they hardly ever do. Right? So, um, so understanding the evidence provided by human behavior uh, is a complicated problem. So when you, when you turn this into math, um, you get what we call an assistance game. So a game is a decision problem involving more than one entity. Uh, here, the entities are the humans and the machines. Um, and this is, mathematically speaking, a game where the humans are the ones that have the payoff function, and the machines are trying to optimize it but don't know exactly what it is. Um, and uh, the, the takeaway is that when you solve the, that game, you solve the machine half of that game, the humans also are part of that game, and we have to figure out how to behave when machines are part of the world. Um, but when you solve the machine part of that game, it doesn't matter how well you solve it. Right? You can solve it in massively superhuman ways, um, and the machine will still be beneficial to us. It will still be deferential to us. Okay? And that's the, that's the key point. Right? There's no ceiling. You, you don't have to say, well, we can't make machines smarter than this in case we lose control over them or anything like that. There are different kind of machines. And they are, uh, in the long run, I hope, provably beneficial. So pictorially, right, if you know what graphical models are, this was the traditional picture. And this is what we, in the first three editions of the textbook, we have human behavior, which is the sort of the, the consequence of human objectives, if you like. Um, but we assume that the human objective is observed. So that's why it's filled in. That means we have evidence for that variable. Okay? Um, and when you have evidence for that variable, um, and the machine is going to now uh, try to pursue what it perceives the human objective to be, if you observe, or at least if you believe you have the correct value of the human objective, then it's a sufficient statistic. And human behavior is then irrelevant. Right? So you could be jumping up and down and saying, no, you're going to destroy the world, but the machine has the objective. Right? And it's whatever it's doing is correct. And so it will just pursue it, and you are irrelevant. Um, now, when the, when the objective is not observed, right, then, then mathematically, these things remain coupled. They are not, they're not conditionally independent. Uh, absolute, they're not absolutely independent. They are only conditionally independent given the objective. So, so the solutions here um, all involve a coupling between machines and humans 
and this is inevitable. Uh, it makes the problem more complicated. Uh, you can't go off and solve Markov decision processes, these single agent decision problems. Um, it makes it more complicated, but it's unavoidable. Um, so actually, I'm going to skip over this example. That's, that's how Google ended up calling somebody a gorilla. Uh, I'm going to skip over this example. And I'm going to talk about these assistance games. Um, so remember, the human is the one with the preferences. We'll call the preference theta, uh, generically. Um, and we assume that the human sort of acts according to theta, because it doesn't have to be perfect or rational, as I mentioned. Um, and the machine has to maximize uh, the human preferences and has some prior uh, P of theta on what uh, human preferences might be. Uh, and when you solve the equilibria, um, the hum on the human side, you see the human teaching the robot, because there's the human wants the robot to learn more about theta so that the robot can be more useful. Um, and the robot will learn, it'll uh, understand the teaching behaviors of the human as conveying the preference information. Uh, it will ask questions, it will ask permission, it will defer to the human. Uh, it will, as I uh, illustrate, that it will allow itself to be switched off, uh, which is sort of a, a key sign that we have something that we can control. Um, so if you know anything about inverse reinforcement learning, inverse reinforcement learning is sort of a one-way version of this, where the machine is sort of watching the human through, uh, through the window, and the human is doing their thing. Um, but but uh, the human is doing their thing as an isolated uh, entity. Um, and that assumption is not valid in general. Right? As soon as the human is aware that there's a machine, uh, the human's behavior can only be interpreted as a solution to this game. Right? So imagine if you're a, um, if you're a, you know, a medical student and you're standing next to the human expert surgeon. You know, the human expert surgeon wouldn't just like do the operation, so, 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 you know, cut, 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 so, 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 done, right? They're going to start saying, they're going to start explaining things like, oh, look what happens if you do this, right? All the blood comes out. Don't do that, <laughs> right? Uh, and so they'll be doing things that, that don't make sense if you just assume the human is doing them in isolation. They only make sense as solutions to this game. So you can only interpret human behavior by solving the game uh, and seeing how, how the uh, human part should be interpreted. So I'm going to illustrate that with a, a very simple game. It's the simplest one to be found where it, that exhibits this phenomenon. Um, so it has uh, basically a one dimension of preference, which is a sort of an exchange rate between paper clips and staples. Right, so theta is the value of this exchange rate. Um, and let's say theta is, is 0.49, so you could think of this as, uh, okay, a paper clip is worth 49 cents and a staple is worth 51 cents. Okay, so that's the sort of exchange rate between paper clips and staples. And the, the robot has no idea what your value of theta is. Some people like paper clips, some people like staples. Um, the robot has no idea. So in the game, right, the human gets to go first and um, can choose to make two paper clips, one of each, or two staples. OK, so those are the three choices for the human. Um, and then the robot gets to go uh, next. Now, if the human was just by themselves, right, what would they do? Well, paperclip is worth 49 cents, staple is worth 51 cents. They would make two staples, right, because that's worth a dollar two. So just from the human point of view, right, the dollar two would dominate, and it would make, uh, would make that choice. Um, now, in this game, after the human has done their thing, the robot gets to do something. The robot gets to make 90 paper clips, 50 of each, or 90 staples. Okay? So now what should the human do? Right? Well, what the human should do depends on how the robot is going to interpret what the human does. <coughs> right? Because uh, the human would like the robot to make whichever of these things is going to make, make the human happiest. Um, but how does it tell the robot um, what its value of theta is if the only choice it has is to make two paper clips, one of each, or two staples, right? It can't, it can't tell the robot, okay, my value for a staple is 49 cents, or paper clips, sorry, is 49 cents. Okay, it just has to make one of these choices. Well, so uh, similarly, how does the robot interpret what the human does? Well, the only way you could solve this problem is actually just to solve the game. Right, to find the Nash equilibrium of the game, 
which is a pair of strategies where uh, neither party would change their strategy uh, if the other party keeps their strategy fixed. Um, and there's only one Nash equilibrium for this game. And um, the Nash equilibrium, when the human has 49 cent value for a paperclip, is to choose 1-1. One, one. Um, and in fact, 1-1 one, one is optimal if your exchange rate is anywhere between 44.6 cents and 55.4 cents. Okay? So from the solution of the game, basically a code uh, has emerged, and that code is telling the robot what range does my uh, exchange rate lie in so that you can do the right thing. Okay? Uh, and the robot assumes that the human has coded their, uh, their preference correctly by making that choice. Okay? And this is not, as you can see, 1-1 one, one is not what the human would do if they were just acting in isolation. Uh, okay, so I'll briefly explain uh, another important property of these machines, which is the off-switch problem, right? So all, all sufficiently large and hunky robots, this is our PR2, which is a 440-pound robot, uh, so you don't want to be <laughs> accidentally crushed by this thing. So it has an off-switch. Um, now, if you, if you program machines the classical way, you give them an, an objective, like fetch the coffee, uh, if it's sufficiently intelligent, it would realize, okay, here's one way I could fail to fetch the coffee, that somebody switches me off. And so the first thing it would do would be to disable its own off switch, right? Because that, that way I avoid that probability of failure. Um, and uh, so this is a lesson of the lecture, right? You can't fetch the coffee if you're dead. So. Um, Let's look at what happens when you have a robot that has uncertainty over, um, over the value of the actions from the point of view of the human. So we, we set up a very simple decision problem. The robot in this, ga in this game gets to go first. And it uh, initially will have two choices, right? So it could um, press its own off switch. In other words, just commit suicide uh, to, to, avoid being, uh, to be avoid being dangerous to the human. Um, or it can do this possibly dangerous action. Like, oh, there's a big red button here. I wonder if I should press it. Well, you know, it says push me, so it's probably a good thing for me to press this button. Um, and so this is expressed by this probability distribution. Uh, so it, it, as a net, you know, there's more probability mass in the plus side of the distribution. So if these were the two choices, and we set the value of switching itself off at zero, if these were two choices, the robot would push the big red button, right? Um, and it wouldn't let you switch it off. That's what we want to avoid. So we're going to give it a choice to do nothing um, and allow the human to uh, switch the robot off. Okay, and the question is, why would the robot do that? Why would the robot let the human switch it off, given that, of course, the robot can switch itself off anyway? Right? And if it doesn't want to switch itself off, why would it let the human switch it off? Right? It sort of seems counterintuitive. Well, of course. If the human doesn't switch the robot off, then the robot knows that the action it was about to do, press the big red button, uh, is a good one. Right? And it, so it wipes out the negative part of the probability distribution about whether this action is desirable from the point of view of human preferences. Um, and so now, uh, waiting actually turns out to be uh, provably dominant over the other two options. Okay. And so allowing yourself to be switched off is actually better than not allowing yourself to be switched off. Um, and that's a, that's a very simple and very general theorem. It's exactly the same theorem as the non-negative expected value of information. Because the human, uh, whether or not the human switches you off, provides you information about what the underlying human preference is. Um, and that information is what you need in order to be useful to the human. Um, so the safety margin here, why the machine allows us to switch it off is because it's uncertain about our preferences. As soon as it becomes certain about our preferences, it will no longer allow itself to be switched off. Um, and so there's this direct relationship between uncertainty and safety, our ability to control the machines. Um, so we're doing, there's a lot of ongoing research as you can imagine, right? So we have to basically take every chapter of the AI textbook uh, and redo it for this new way of thinking, because every single chapter 
I can assure you, because I wrote them, uh, <laughs> every single chapter is based on the assumption that the objective is known. Uh, you know, if you look at search algorithms, right, there's a goal uh, and a cost function, right? And you have to know those before you can even call the algorithm. Okay, but what if you don't? Well, we don't have the equivalent uh, theory developed yet. So there's a lot of work to do for every, for every form of AI, whether it's you know, machine learning with uncertain loss functions. So is it better to call a person a gorilla or to call an apple an orange? Which of those two things is worse? Well, you know, initially, you might not, the algorithm might not know. Uh, so it has uncertainty about the loss function. Um, <coughs> Uh, we have to deal with the fact that uh, humans are imperfect, as I said. Their behavior does not uh, perfectly reflect their underlying preferences, so you have to kind of reverse engineer human cognition. Um, in particular, right, you know, even Lee Sedol plays losing moves. It doesn't mean he wants to lose, even though he's playing losing moves. Right? He's trying to win, but he's not smart enough, so he plays losing moves. You have to understand that in order to interpret his behavior. Um, we also have to deal with the fact that there are many humans. Uh, this is a really important thing. Uh, that's why we have uh, all those social science departments on campus uh, and even some of the humanities departments are about the fact that there are many humans um, and how do you deal with that. Um, so just to give you one simple example, right? Uh, you've got a robot that's serving multiple people. How do you make decisions when you know, they all want to be ruler of the universe. They can't all be ruler of the universe, right? You have to make trade-offs when you're acting on behalf of more than one person. How should you do that? Well, um, so John Harsanyi, who is a Berkeley uh, econ professor who won the Nobel Prize, uh, is actually, I've been, I never met him, but I've been reading a lot of his stuff uh, in the course of doing this work, and a uh, very brilliant, insightful person. Um, so he showed what's sometimes called the social aggregation theorem, that when, uh, when people have a common prior, so when everyone has the same beliefs about how the future is going to unfold, so the same probability distribution over future state sequences, under that common prior assumption, uh, Harsanyi showed that uh, all Pareto optimal policies, which means all policies that are not strictly dominated by some other policy, all Pareto op optimal policies uh, end up looking like you take a linear combination of the preferences of the individuals. Okay, and uh, you could argue, so in, in there's a Nash bargaining theory which says, well, the weights in that linear combination depend on the bargaining power of the individuals. Uh, for example, their ability to just defect from the whole thing. Um, and Harsanyi argues on the basis of uh, equality that the weights should all be the same. Um, but this is a fundamental theory, a fundamental theorem of, of welfare economics and, and, uh, and public policy and, and many, uh, many other spheres. So it turns out that when people don't have a common prior, uh, you get a completely different solution. Okay? And so the solution that we just published last year is that um, all Pareto optimal policies have weights for the individual preferences that reflect how well that person's predictions turned out to agree with reality. Right? So this is a theorem, right? We can't help it. Uh, you might not like it, right? But what it means is that if you, if, if you have bizarre beliefs about the future and they just continually turn out to be wrong, uh, any system that's, that's operating on, on your behalf and the behalf of other people is going to downweight your preferences. And why is that? Um, because everyone believes that they are right. Okay? So they will agree to this. They will agree that uh, they will agree to a policy that rewards the people who are right because everyone thinks they are that person. Right? No one actively believes that their own beliefs are incorrect. Um, and so you will agree to these conditions, basically a conditional contract that says if your prediction turns out to be right, you get the prize. And if his prediction turns out to be right, he gets the prize. And both of you agree to this contract because you both think you're going to get the prize, right? And so that's just a mathematical fact about how uh, you have to act on behalf of many people. So the social consequences of this, I don't know yet, right? I haven't, I haven't even talked to social scientists about this, uh, about this theorem, but it's a true theorem. It's also very useful, right? It means you can negotiate contracts 
between American, America and Russia, because both people think the other side is going to cheat and they're not, uh, and so on. So you can, you can negotiate conditional contracts that they will both agree to, even though they don't agree uh, about the facts and, and uh, about each other. OK. Um, I have to skip over altruism, say, indifference, and sadism. But if you're interested, you can read the book. Um, I, I don't have a copy either. But, uh, <laughs> but I have a picture of it, um, and it's on the web. And sure. oh, there you do. OK, this is the American edition. That was the, that was the English edition, actually, the, uh, that one. Yeah, so thank you, Randy. Uh, anyway, and um, so if, if we're lucky, and if we've solved all those uh, conundrums about uh, how to deal with multiple people and so on, we have, we have this very nice altruistic robot. Uh, it's going to give equal weight to, to everyone's preferences. Um, and, uh, and then it welcomes you home after a long day at work. And you say, ah, it's a really terrible day. I didn't have, have time for lunch. You must be quite hungry. Starving, is there anything for dinner? There's something I need to tell you. <laughs> right. What comes next? Well, uh, there are humans in Somalia, and they're in more urgent need of help than you are. So please make your own dinner. <laughs> Right, so that's a that's a problem, right? Uh, uh, an altruistic robot that gives equal weight to the preferences of all human beings is going to probably not pay much attention to your uh, your Western middle class comfortable needs, uh, and um, and so there's a real problem. Of course, you right, you just paid fifty thousand dollars for this robot, and the first thing it does is disappear to Somalia. You're not going to be happy, right? In fact, uh, that company would quickly go out of business. So we do have to solve this problem, right? It's not, it's not, you can't just put in you know, simple utilitarian altruistic uh, solutions into machines and hope that something, uh, something sensible is going to happen. So to summarize, uh, lots of has cool stuff happening in AI, rapid progress, uh, great stuff coming down the pipe. Um, it's hard to predict when we're going to have general purpose AI, but it's going to be, um, I've argued uh, in the book actually, the, the biggest event in human history. Uh, and we are totally unprepared for it. Um, and that's a, that's a serious problem, and we're trying to figure it out. So this is one proposal for how we might be able to retain control over arbitrarily intelligent machines uh, forever. Um, the other problems that I mentioned, the problem of misuse and the overuse, uh, I don't have anything like a solution for. Um, these are social and political problems, policing, uh, culture, and so on. They're not technical problems, although you know, a better solution to cybersecurity would be a help um, on the misuse side. But um, these are problems that we all have to deal with. Uh, and the sooner we start, the better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, we went a little over time, but this was really fascinating. I know we maybe have time for a question or two. This is our magical new branded microphone. So you hold it like this and you ask a question. Do we have any questions? People who won't sleep tonight if they don't get them answered. Yes. Hi. Um, speaking as a circuit designer rather than a computer scientist, I'm wondering if you could go back and clarify exactly what you meant by bigger circuits not encoding information in the, in the correct way. And in what sense is the brain not a circuit in the same way that the, the TPUs are a circuit? Well, so the, your, right, your laptop is a circuit, the TPU is a circuit, your brain is a circuit. But it's a circuit that, uh, certainly in the case of a computer, implements a higher level of abstraction which is the programming language, right? So it's whether it's assembly language or a higher level language. Uh, and those, those, for example, give you things like loops. Uh, and, and loops enable you to enumerate across a, arbitrarily many objects. Um, so when you look at the rules of chess implemented in C++, there's all kinds of loops there, right? Um, and if you had to, instead of, um, instead of having a loop, you had to have a piece of circuitry for each iteration of that loop, basically, which is, which is what current deep learning systems do, uh, then it, doesn't, it just doesn't scale.
thank you for your talk. I was wondering um, what your thoughts on, because I believe he mentioned that you were in kind of a neuro, neurological department or something like that? Well, I had a faculty position in neurological surgery, <coughs> oh, okay, which actually so. has nothing to do with, <laughs> neuro, with, with neurons. It was actually like how to stop people from dying mm -hmm. after they have brain injuries, oh, okay. but yeah. Well, um, I was just kind of wondering what your thoughts on are on um, how much more we may need to know about how like our own brain works and how we ourselves learn things and how that is going to play with our ability to then program something and create something that can also learn. Uh, that's a great question and I think it, it's, it's varied over time. The, uh, at the beginning of AI there was great excitement about uh, cross-fertilization between psychology and neuroscience uh, and AI and to some extent linguistics, that was what we called cognitive science. So there was huge excitement about this new synthetic discipline, but it kind of failed um, and we sort of subsided into its constituent disciplines because the neuroscientists by and large have mostly focused on the fact that it's incredibly hard to even find out what it's made of um, and, and how it operates at the, at the level of the individual circuit. Um, so it hasn't, the, the promise that by studying the brain we would, um, we would know how to do AI hasn't, mostly hasn't come to pass. And for most of, let's say from the 70s until, uh, you know, 10 years ago, um, people didn't pay that much attention. But then it turned out that convolutional neural networks, which were partly inspired by what we knew about the visual cortex, um, just turned out to work much better than people expected. Um, and so that, that pipeline has kind of reopened uh, when it was closed for a long time. So I if we, as we get better tools, um, so fMRI is not such a great tool. It doesn't, you don't really get a sense of how the brain does any. I mean, you sort of know, now, now I know, you know where cabbage is in my brain, um, but I still don't know how how I do anything with, with that. Um, but other, you know, optogenetic techniques where you can modify the DNA of, of neurons and observe their operation directly, I think we could see uh, real advances in our understanding of, of how the brains, at least of simple animals, work um, fairly soon. But the other interesting thing is that uh, when you look at brain-machine interfaces, right, we, we connect robot arms to brains, we thought originally, and I'm giving a very high level summary, right? We thought originally that we would have to understand the code of the motor cortex uh, and, and sort of decode that code and tell the robot arm what to do. So we, we had to solve a big part of neuroscience to get this to work. It turns out we don't. It turns out that the brain figures out how to use the robot arm rather than the other way around. Um, and so we, get the, we can get these advances without really understanding how it works. Um, we could get advances, for example, where we were able to augment human memory, again, without understanding how it works. We just find some place in the brain that we connect something that operates as a memory chip, and the brain figures out how to use it to store and retrieve information. Uh, and we still have no clue what's going on, but now our IQ is 290, right? Or we connect brains to each other, and, uh, and we have some form of telepathy that we don't understand, um, and, and we become a hive mind, and again, we have no idea how our minds work, but we made a hive mind. Isn't that cool? Right, so, so who knows what's going to happen with that? But do you think that um, that will kind of translate to our ability to create this like kind of separate AI system? I mean, all those things were like kind of interacting with our brain more directly. Um, it could, and as uh, yeah. So, in the, in the process, we'll develop better technology for understanding and mapping neural activity. Um, so the Neural Dust project here at Berkeley is one that could give you a much finer grain sort of real-time mapping of neural activity and, and maybe we'll understand it. Um, but it's very hard to understand. That's, I think that's, part, that's clear already. Uh, we have one last question back here. Hi, um, yeah, very interesting. I was curious, I guess, a little bit about the mathematical portions of your talk. You were sh saying that, you know, we could show mathematically that if the if a robot or a machine or you know a system defers to you know learn more about 
the human preference preferences or takes an action to learn more about human preferences or in the case of this multi human uh, problem like learns to see which um, people were more accurate about the future but what if I mean I guess my question is how would you uh, deal with the fact that you know like the um, I guess the actions by the robot, you know, might change um, the human's preferences or, you know, might change their behaviors and um, or that, you know, like whatever, you know, initial choice for the action, like or in this multi-human example, like whatever initial, you know, guess for who to, whose preferences to follow changes the way the future unfolds. And if the robot had chosen some other thing, then some completely other person would have turned out to be more accurate about the future. I mean, like, is that... Is that easy to solve mathematically or straightforward? Yeah, so, so you, you mentioned several problems. Uh, yeah. the, but I think the, co the core is this issue of plasticity. And I, I, it was up on the slide, but I zoomed by it. Um, but yes, you, you want to avoid the failure mode where the machine satisfies human preferences by changing them to be extremely easy to satisfy. Right? So if the machine made us all heroin addicts, then the only thing we would want is heroin. And it's easy for the machine to make lots of heroin. And so that would, that, that would solve the problem. So, so you need to have elaborations for that, right? This model assumes hu that human preferences are fixed, and they obviously are not. Um, but you can't, you can't leave human preferences completely untouched. I mean, just having a robot servant is going to change your preferences, right? You're probably going to become a bit more spoiled uh, mm -hmm. and impatient with other humans and blah, blah, blah. So, um, so this is a, an open question. Philosophers have a hard time with uh, changing preferences because uh, it's never rational, at least in the simple view, to change your own preferences because then you will, in future, act in ways that are contrary to your current preferences. So why would I turn myself into someone who will do things that I don't think should be done? Right? It doesn't make sense. But nonetheless, our preferences do change. And sometimes we, we decide that we want our preferences to change. We say, you know, I, I think if I, if I travel around the world, I'll come back a better person, uh, right? Um, so it's a kind of an experiment where you just hope that the outcome of the experiment is, is something that you will sort of be glad that you became. It's hard to just even talk about correctly. Um, so I'm teaching a course next semester with two philosophers and economists, and this is one of the topics that we're going to try to get into. Um, so good question. All right. All right. Great. Thank you, Stuart. Appreciate uh, finding time. Uh, I just think one of the most valuable contributions you make is not just the, the intellectual depth, but making some of these problems uh, really resonate with people outside the field. And I think bringing them into the conversation is huge. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I think you, you might have, if you can corner him, you can have a few questions. Oh, thank you. That's cool. Any chance I can get? Of course. Of course you can. Yeah.